Right, hey everyone, thanks for joining um, the latest uh, Legal Vision webinar. Uh, we've been doing a few of these over the last uh, couple of months and, and they've been going down well. So um, we've got about, I think, uh, 300 uh, res respond people who are going to attend. We'll probably wait another two minutes before we start. Um, whilst we're waiting, um, you know, quick introduction. So um, hopefully some of you know, uh, my name's Lachlan, I'm a CEO here at Legal Vision. Uh, I do a bunch of these, um, I do a bunch of these um, webinars. So some of you may have uh, may have um, se se seen me on these before. Today, I've got uh, Jill Finlay uh, joining. Um, and look, I'll, I'm just gonna let Jill introduce herself rather than uh, go into all of her various uh, accomplishments. So Jill, do you wanna uh, quickly introduce yourself before we get started? No worries. Thanks for having me, Lachlan. Um, I'm Jill Findlay. I currently am both the CEO of VAMP and I've now recently started um, working at Airtree as a partner. So I'm transitioning out of VAMP where we find a new CEO and transitioning into Airtree. So I've got a useful perspective cool. on raising capital, <clears throat> both from an operator and a, and a very recent VC, I will add. Very recent. Great. And look, as everyone hopefully knows, um, you know, uh, otherwise you probably wouldn't be on on uh, on this webinar. Uh, what we're talking about today is raising capital, and um, yeah, that's that's obviously why I've asked Jill to join because um, apart from her experience as CEO of Vamp, ra raising a bunch of capital there, her, her role at Airtree now, she was previously COO at Safety Culture, um, and obviously over the years they've raised lots and lots of capital. Um, so she's got a heap of experience, which, which she's going to share with us. I think we can get started now. I mean, uh, you know, if anyone's late, we'll have recorded this anyway. So, so let's jump sort of straight into it. So, so yeah, look, um, what, what I kind of wanted to do is, is get into the kind of guts of, of raising capital rather than, you know, the sort of, um, a lot of, a lot of seminars you attend really kind of, you know, go into the real basics, which hopefully everyone on this call you know, it's kind of got their head around. And if you haven't, just download the Legal Vision Startup Manual, which um, is a handout on um, on 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 go to webinar, which we'll send to every attendee after this anyway, because that's where you can kind of get the basics. What's probably going to be more interesting with Jill is to is to get into her her experience um, throughout uh, the years in terms of raising capital. Um, and so, to, to, to kind of you know give a bit of background, you're someone Jill who who came to startups a little later in your career than um, than you know I guess someone st starting straight out of uni. Do you want to give a bit of background there as to, to how you got into startups? Yep. <clears throat> so originally um, I started in consulting. So I was at Anderson Consulting um, and then with Deloitte. So. Um, a great kind of fundamentals in learning the basics of finance. So I, I qualified as a chartered accountant there. Um, obviously in consulting, you're learning new industries, new companies um, every week, um, which I think is awesome background um, for then going into a startup. But my first startup experience was actually in a corporate. I worked for a gaming company and I was responsible for setting up their digital um, arm of that company, which had no budget, no resources, no nothing. We just had the existing assets of, of the big corporate. So it was a lot of begging um, and stealing from other parts of the business. But I think that really gave me um, the, the bug for startup. So I left corporate um, in a nice paying job and all the perks that go along with the corporate. And I worked for Car Next Door for a, a few months on $60,000. Um, and that really taught me about, you know, every day in a startup with limited resources, you have to um, you have to return your investment. So what Car Next Door were paying me, I'd work out what they were paying me each day, and I would try to get at least kind of 10x what they were paying me back to them that day. So it was all about outcomes, how we were going to grow the business. Um, it was an amazing experience. And from Car Next Door, then um, Mike Cannon Brooks uh, introduced me to Lucania, the the founder of Safety Culture, and both him and I uh, scaled up Safety Culture over four years. And um, pleased to say it's now one of Australia's unicorns, but um, mm. that was an amazing experience. And I think 
everything that I'd done previously in corporates was really useful to Luke. Luke had never worked in a corporate before. Um, Safety Culture was one of his first businesses. So I think part partnering with somebody who had a lot of commercial experience and um, I suppose corporate experience, finance experience really helped him. So we made, we made a good pair for a long time. Um, and I think yep. uh, same, same with VAMP as well. So obviously the experience I had in Safety Culture really helped with VAMP as CEO. Yeah, cool. Everyone probably knows what Safety Culture does, hopefully. Vam, do you want to quickly explain what, what, what Vam does before we Vamp, get into it? Yeah, Vamp's a marketing technology company. So uh, it creates, we we are a marketplace and, and platform for creating social content. Okay, cool. We'll go back to those various experiences uh, later in, in the webinar as we talk about raising capital um, in, in those different environments. But Let's get let's get into the kind of um, guts of what, what we're talking about, which is you know ultimately raising capital. And a, a, a question that a few of um, the attendees have sent through, um, you know, uh, beforehand, and which I think is a super important question, um, really relates to when is it not a good time to, or when shouldn't you be raising capital when you're a high growth company? Everyone wants to talk about, oh, I want to raise capital. I'm raising capital. When should I do? This and so forth? When should you not be raising capital? You should not be raising capital when you absolutely need it and have no money in the bank or running out of cash fast. That is my one piece of advice. You really yeah. have to plan your raise. You know, everyone should should have, you know, six months runway um, in the bank. Uh, obviously, VCs are moving quite quickly these days, but it still takes time to raise and you don't want to be... Um, having a lack of options when you raise. So I think that would be one of yep. the best pieces of advice I could give. Yep, and, yep, obviously, yep. Yep. and obviously don't take it when there's other cheaper sources of funding. And I know you're a big proponent of this, Lachlan. It's one of the, why, why you asked this first question. Um, Cause I think, I think you at Legal Vision are, are always educating businesses that it's not just about equity. Equity is obviously the most expensive form of capital and there are other forms of capital out there. So um, not, not every yeah. form of capital will be available to every startup, but they should know about them all. Yeah, certainly as we see, um, we've been saying the last probably three, four years, at least venture debt's become more and more popular for, for later stage kind of growth startups that are generating a reasonable amount of cash. Um, so yeah, and I guess the, the other one that, that's always interesting when you're, when you're kind of thinking about raising equity is, you know, VC capital is a, is a very specific type of, of VC capital, which is not the sort of capital suitable for everyone because of, I guess, the requirements uh, in terms of growth that a VC has. And do you want to give a bit of context as to, to, to that? Yeah, obviously, um, I know from Airtree's point of view, we're looking for businesses that are, are really high growth. Um, and that's, you know, that's doubling year on year type growth that we'd be looking at. So we'd want to take, you know, relatively um, large percentages of equity and high growth tech businesses that can scale. So it's you know the the investment mandate is is can be quite narrow for VC in that space. And I think that's a super important for a founder to really kind of think about when, when they're on this you know capital raising path is do they want to you know have a kind of ten year journey where they're going to be growing the business at maybe more than fifty percent you know sometimes a hundred percent year on year on year on year which is frankly you know relatively kind of stressful. Um, and very challenging thing to do. You know, do you really want that? Um, that's a, that, that's something that I think founders don't think about a lot. They think, oh, of course, you know, I want to raise from Airtree, I want to raise from Blackbird. That's going to be cool. It's going to be sexy. But what's your life going to be like? And is that what you aspire to? And I think those are you know legitimate questions that you should ask before you you, you jump on the um, the VC uh, bandwagon, I guess. Um, and I sorry. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> No, I was going to say, yeah, I think that's right. And whether VC is right for you or not. And then if you decide VC is right for you, then you need to decide on the right VC. Uh, so mm -hmm. as you said, you're in a, a, a long term relationship with this um, investor. So you've got to you've got to make sure that it's someone you'd look to for advice. You'd look to to be there for you in times of trouble. Um, 
it's it's a relationship that's not easy to unwind so doing good due diligence on on selecting your vc is really important you know speak to other founders who um those those uh vcs have worked with get do your background checks you know really dig in don't just you know yeah. take take the first offer that comes along like any relationship and i think that's that's much more possible in australia sort of now than it was sort of maybe you know six seven years ago because you know a bunch of the bigger vcs the air trees the blackbirds the square pegs have been around for a while now i've actually you know, taking companies or being with companies through through a life cycle have had you know probably failed investments um, and you know I guess it's talking to to to, to the founders of maybe less successful um, investee companies um, you know about how how the um, the particular VC dealt with dealt with you know that situation uh, it's probably pretty interesting and 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 worth considering yeah I think that's um, a lot. Okay, another big one that, you know, like we see this all the time um, at, at Legal Vision, because um, obviously we, we, we assist a lot of um, companies with their capital raises. We do more capital raises than any law firm in Australia. We're, you know, by far number one in terms of both the volume and also the quality of the startups and the VCs that, that we act for. So, so we're, you know, we, we see a lot of this, which is, you know, founders coming to us saying, I've got this sort of um, startup advisor who's going to help me raise money and is going to take a percentage of, 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 of um, the capital that, I've, that, that, that we're raising. Um, and often, you know, well, these, these, these characters um, are not, don't seem to be doing anything particularly useful. On the other hand, if they do introduce you to the right, you know, source of capital, then, you know, I guess that's good. I mean, do you kind of have a view of, you know the kind of startup scene, the advisors. Uh, is it a good idea to bring on board someone to help you or not? I, I think I, I'd, I'd support your point earlier that in the Australian community, it's it's so easy to get a referral. So I think the startup community, and in, in, I, I know Sydney startup community well, it's a great referral network. Founders will tell yeah. other founders um, who to speak to in the investment community. There's so many kind of um, open resource lists of investors. I know Airtree has a as as open sourced a list of all investors in Australia through from you know angel right through to to P pre IPO the whole spectrum. So um, yeah. there. The information's available out there. Uh, I wouldn't. I would just start having conversations because you start one conversation and it will definitely lead to another. And even if you start a conversation with an investor where your business isn't right for them, I'm sure they'll know somebody that they can pass you on to that w it will be right to. So I'd yeah. say, just once you start the conversation, it's like a flywheel effect. And rather than paying six percent to an advisor. It's a huge chunk of change of all your hard mm. work of pitching. Uh, I think just start the conversation, and then if, if that doesn't work, then it's something to consider. But it's not really something I'd be diving straight in for if I was a fan straight away. Spend spend the six percent on legal fees. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a better way of going about it. <laughs> not that it would be six percent to be no. very clear. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, and the other thing on that, which I think is another interesting development in the in the Australian startups seen over the last couple of years is you sort of see the air trees, the blackbirds in particular have, have changed from you know saying oh you know it's we, we'd like it if you someone we know has introduced you to us to actually being much more we welcome you know anyone. I think this whole concept of you know rather than having kind of you know I guess a network of I don't know private school people who are kind of introducing each other. You've kind of opened that up um, to really anyone um, can pitch and it's taken seriously. And and so that's again another reason why an advisor, at least for introductions, is probably not particularly necessary. Um, okay, so so look again to go back to I think we've kind of everyone on, on the webinar hopefully has a pretty good kind of um, idea that you know VCs are looking for super high growth companies and and generally you know, tech businesses or, you know, businesses with tech at the absolute, you know, core of their business. So if if you're not doing that, probably not worth thinking about VC. Having said that, if you are doing that um, and you're kind of at the super early stages and, and you've decided you're going to go down the, 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 the capital raising path and the VC path in particular, you know, what are the next steps? What are the things you really need to kind of, um, I guess be focused on in order to give yourself the best chance possible of 
you know, of, of potentially securing a, a, a VC investor. I think it's getting your pitch down and being amazing at it. And that mm -hmm. obviously your pitch evolves over time, but I'd say practice, get feedback, iterate, go through that process again and again, telling your founder story and getting the real value prop of your business it is actually quite hard and it takes effort and it takes commitment. So I think that's really important. And that's like obviously pitching it to someone over a coffee as well as, you know, like having a proper pitch deck um, together. So I think that's really where you have to start. And then once you have your pitch deck and you've got your pitch down pat, then just start having these conversations. Um, I know there's a number of pitch decks that, that actually you can go get feedback fish burners here in sydney do these regularly there's lots of opportunities out there and um i said earlier the startup community is good at referrals it's also good at feedback so you're gonna yeah. get you're gonna get you're gonna get ripped apart nine times out of ten but you take that feedback on you listen mm -hmm. to the questions you listen to the feedback bake it into your pitch and then go again yeah and i think you know on that it's not like when you kind of go to you know to have a chat with you know, a, a, you know, a partner at a, at a VC fund that you, that you kind of have to, you know, pitch to a, to a slide deck. But I think it's more that kind of, can you really explain your business um, and why it's going to be super successful really concisely? And yeah. that's something that doesn't change whether you're kind of in the first month of starting your startup or, you know, raising your series E, um, you know, 10 years on because, it changes, you know, the, the business changes, the um, the value proposition changes, the, the, the growth opportunity changes. And, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, in some ways, like, you you, you know, you, you're constantly ha having to pitch, right? Um, which, yeah, which which is a, a skill set that is probably more important than people think, I think. Um, so, no, that's interesting. And in terms of, I guess, the Australian kind of, startup scene um and we'll go into um your experiences raising you know at a company level um, later but you know how do you kind of well there's lots of vcs now there seems to be you know a new new vc fund every couple of months how do you, how does a, a new founder go about being okay well who should i approach um obviously approach airtree first because it's the best um what i would do if i was a founder is look at the deals that they've done look at the size of the deals the stage the sector and do they look similar to what you're trying to do so i think yeah. um each each vc will be slightly different in terms of uh, the, the companies obviously that they've invested in and as i said yeah. earlier i think asking other founders is really important so and Air Trade, uh, what are the what are the what you know what are you looking for at Airtree? like it's <laughs> um well well I'll tell you, I think some, probably some good advice would be mm. at Airtree what we evaluate when every deal comes through. So um, the things that we are looking for, um, number one yeah. is the team. So the founder, co-founders, whoever that team is, it is the number one priority for, for us. And yeah. I think it will be the number one priority. Um, I think having, having obviously previous success is always a big tick in the box um so if you've had a, a startup previously that's been successful then it always makes it easier to get in and with, with the next startup um and and to, to to touch on your point earlier about the pitch and um knowing how to pitch i think knowing how to pitch yourself is really important because you are mm -hmm. you're the you are the thing that the vcs are investing in you're 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 the product more than the tech so I think that's yeah. that's really important and getting your story and, and your your passion for your startup and, and why you think it's going to be successful for you personally. So yeah. so definitely team number one. Then we'd obviously look at product market fit. So what what traction have you had in the market and and the size of the market, key customer wins, customer testimonials. We'd look at unit yeah. economics, you know, can this business scale and scale rapidly if we get the unit economics yeah. right? clear differentiation or competitive advantage you know some some technologies we see we see the three kind of slight variances of the same platform coming through in a week and and kind of getting that clear di differentiation is really important and then obviously there's you know the, the final part is around financials and forecasts as well yeah, so yeah. 
that's how we evaluate. That's that's what we're looking at. That's the, the okay. fact. Is it? I do think the unit economics one's interesting because uh, you know you see a lot of founders who frankly don't seem to be able to add up. You know, and and and, and if you can't like if you don't, if you don't understand the unit economics, how 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 your business is going to generate, um, you know, revenue, you know what. what the, the the acquisition costs, lifetime value, all that sort of thing. I think you can probably get away with with it, but you have to be absolutely brilliant from a product perspective if if you're not kind of on top of of, of that. Um, and, and it seems to me something that actually you can kind of learn pretty pretty easily. Um, and so it's worth spending spending the time on, um, at least in my view. Um, Okay, no, that's interesting. And by the way, just to mention, um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna hopefully take the last twenty minutes of this um, to, um, to to answer questions. So make sure that you're um, you know typing in any questions in the chat function um, a, a, as you go, because we'll get to them. And um, I think you know with these sessions, it's always more interesting when when we're answering um, your questions rather than just you know chatting. So. Jill, one thing I wanted to, to get into is you you've been involved with raising capital, you know, let, let's let's say um, you know, certainly at um safety culture and event. Two very different businesses, um, at different kind of stages in, in, in their life cycle and so on and so forth. Can you give us a bit of a sense as to, you know, how that worked and how it was different and and all that sort of thing? Sure. Um, so I came in at Safety Culture and Series A, um, and then so our next was Series B, which was coming from Index Ventures. So it was mm -hmm. the first, obviously, Blackbird came in at Series A, um, Index, obviously, UK, US, uh, big VC mm -hmm. firm, new for us at Safety Culture. So um, that was an interesting experience. Obviously, we had to go through due diligence, like thorough due, due diligence, have forecasts, have loads of information that wasn't necessarily immediately available to us, but then we knew that we needed to have it. So there is quite a lot of groundwork when you are raising like a Series B, and I think it was about 30, 30 million or so we were raising. Um, yeah. So lots of, you know, it does take finance time to get the information you need, setting up data rooms, go through legal due diligence, you know. Oh, and, and, when, due and, and I think this will be interesting for, for, for everyone. Like when we talk about the information there, like the financial, well, what are we actually talking about in terms of the, the details of it? So a lot of, a lot of your core metrics. So, yeah. you know, it, what kind of underlines your business. So they'd look at that a, a lot, you know, obviously customer churn, you know, ARR, MR, you know, all those standard, well, Safety Culture was SaaS business, so all those standard SaaS metrics that um, mm -hmm. we had to, to had to, we, we had a data analytics team, so it wasn't too hard, but for some businesses, you know, you really need to think about going into due diligence does take resources. So CDC, yeah. CDC we also had to, you know, we had a legacy ESOP in place that we had to uh, revise the ESOP. So there was a, there was actually a lot of work that went in Series mm -hmm. B. But once mm -hmm. we'd done Series B and um, Series C was 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 a lot easier. I think it was sixty million dollars on Series C. And uh, and mm -hmm. Lachlan, this will make you happy. We only spent forty five thousand dollars on legal fees for Series C for a sixty million dollar round. So that's not quite your six or ten. And um, but I think yeah. we've done. So so much groundwork, you know, that the head of finance, Ben, um, had done so much groundwork in, in Series B. Mm. By the time CDC come al came along, we were well versed in, you know, yeah. the due diligence process. But what I would say was, look, look in here, who's the founder of Safety Culture, is one of the best founders I've ever seen in raising capital. He was amazing. Uh, obviously, wow. uh, we we got to raise a, a lot of money, but um, he he was exceptional at that. Um, you know, beyond anyone I've ever yeah. seen, which is good. If you're a founder and you can raise capital, it's amazing. You know. And what went, and, and what were some of the characteristics that you know that the, the things that I guess that, that he did well that you know meant he was good at raising capital in your view? I think the the founder story and selling the vision mm -hmm. and the potential of the business and and really showing that passion for it and yeah. uh, really and and I think an unwavering belief in the mission and and in the worth of the business, you know, he he had you know yep. set targets in his head that he you know he was he was going for, and and he went for them. 
So I'd say safety culture, raising money, Luke was amazing at it. We had a good team behind us and um, we raised, you know, de decent series B and C and then secondaries as well. Safety culture have then gone on uh, to raise secondary amounts of funding, um, which meant that early, early employees yep. could sell out their shares as well, which was a really awesome thing to be able to do after, you know, people have been in the business for, you know, six, seven yep. years, hard graft to be able to, you know, yeah, pay them sure. back. And that was really important at Safety Culture that and, we were able to do that. And how is that? How has it been different at Vamp? Obviously, moving to a different type of business, um, you know, not necessarily, um, I guess, a unicorn sort of, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of business may, you know, soon maybe. But um, you know, how's that been different? You know, raising in a different environment. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you're in a SaaS business that's growing, you know, eight percent month on month it's going to be easier to find funding than it is for a business going through transformation. So um, when I took the role at VAMP, it was to take VAMP from a really successful um, technology enabled business to a true mm. technology, technology business. Um, yep. I think so it's much harder to raise as, you know, we were looking for, you know, VC or at least kind of, um, emerging business type equities. Um, mm -hmm. so we we actually had pre-IPO funding in the cap table to begin with, and then mm -hmm. we raised money to buy out that secondary so that we could have a longer runway for this business. So rather than moving to an IPO within you know 12 to 18 months, we wanted mm -hmm. to buy buy time for the business because it was going through this transformation and wanted to give it as much time as possible to see the potential and really push the valuation up for the business. So yep. it was it was it was a much tougher journey than sa safety culture was because of that, you know, mm. SaaS B service, B tech led yep. kind of business. But we ended up having, you know, awesome institutional investors in Investec and then had other instos, perennial and others follow on with a, you know, mm. still with a reasonable time frame for institutional investors of, you know, three mm. to five years to exit rather than, you know, the traditional pre-IPO of 12, 12 months. Yeah, so. and that's interesting. So if you if you think about the sort of Australian market, you've obviously got the kind of, I guess you'd say the kind of more pure tech kind of VCs, the, you know, the air trees, the blackbirds and square pegs and the like, but there's also a, you know, a group of, I guess, more institutional, but interested in kind of the, the, the tech space and willing to kind of invest in, in maybe a little later stage tech businesses, um, and that's that's more the group that you kind of um, you know I guess spoke to in relation to to, to Vamp's uh, raise. Yeah, once once we yeah. secured Investec, it was much easier to get other in stores to come in. Perennial mm. were following on; they were already in the business early, um, mm. and they wanted to to come in again after they saw the traction that the business was having in the growth trajectory and the transformation that it was going through. So yeah. once you get once you get it's easy it's always easy to get once you get your first investors, everyone mm -hmm. gets FOMO and wants to jump in. So getting that yeah. first one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. for sure. And what, hey, what we've got a whole bunch more things that we're going to talk about, but why don't we jump into some questions because we've only got 15 minutes left and there's some good questions here. So um the first one, um, you know, it's an interesting one, and it's coming up more and more actually. Is should I consider crowdfunding? Uh, do you have a view on crowdfunding? You know, uh, I I don't really have a view on crowdfunding. Do you have a view on crowdfunding? Yeah. I think, look, my my view is crowdfunding works or can work if you have a a real kind of product based. Um, uh, business that you know like kind of a, a beer business or, or th th that kind of business that you know individuals will go oh I like the idea of that I'll I'll kind of invest yeah. um I a think it becomes a customer think, advocacy yeah yeah exactly right um and, and and that seems to have worked well for um I think you know uh, brew dog for instance done that all over um all over the world actually in different countries they've kind of raised through through crowdfunding but yeah, look, it's it's certainly um, becoming easier to do, I think, here, here in Australia. Um, but in terms of volume of deals, it's fair to say 
you know, the, the volume of VC deals that that, um, that we've seen over the last sort of 18 months has kind of like really been growing. Whereas, you know, yeah. crowdfunding, yeah, it's happening, but I don't think it's it's kind of hit that kind of trajectory yet. So. And I'd be surprised, uh, yeah. And obviously the scale of the funding that you could raise through crowdfunding be versus VC and other forms is very different. You know, you can yeah. raise hundreds of millions of dollars through VC. Yeah, I think that would be, that'd be challenging in crowdfunding, but I'm sure if you were raising yeah. a smaller amount, then it's definitely, you know, seed funding for something that has customer advocacy and really kind of cult, yeah. Um, yeah. then it would be an option. It's not something I've got yeah, yeah. into. No, no, for sure. This is a good one. So, what, what are the advantages? Because you've done, you've done both, both of these. What are the advantages and disadvantages for Australian companies looking to raise capital in Australia compared to the US? Well, I guess more just like compared raising in the US and Australia, and what works um, best. I think re well, raising in Australia is good because you actually, um, I think the network that the Australian VC community has is, is really tight. And so Airtree and Blackbird and SquarePeg, they all invest together often and they have a good mm. relationship. Um, and I think that is definitely an advantage of having one of them on your side in Australia. Um, <clears throat> obviously, um, Australian VCs are now investing a lot with US VCs as well. So they have yeah. a lot of those connections already. Um, but I yeah. think that the tight net network and you know it's not I don't think we see yourself as competitors I think we just see mm -hmm. ourselves both as part of the same ecosystem so and I, and I think it's, it's a healthy good relationship there yeah yeah for sure yeah I think it's interesting because we um you know we, we, we act for a lot of startups that will, will often do their their first their kind of C maybe series A uh, with Australian VCs by the time they're getting to you know, a series A1 or a, or a B and they're raising the kind of 30 to $40 million check, then you often see, um, a, you know, a, an overseas uh, VC, often US, sometimes, you know, Chinese or whatever, uh, come in and, and lead that round, yeah. uh, which is, you know, obviously I know Airtree have raised a, um, another big round. So you, you have, um, you know, that kind of, um, that spare powder to invest in, in larger later stage rounds, but that, it still does seem to be that the, the, the US investors will come in later. I guess the only um, they can write bigger sort of checks. situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the, the, one, the other thing that we do see a fair bit, um, not a fair bit, but is, is those startups that are wanting to, to kind of get to the US super early will, you know, raise their kind of seed and series A in the US. The, I guess the downside, or well not downside, but something that you have to consider is that you you then do have to set up a US holding company. Um, and so then you're kind of, um, you know, you, you, you're having to run things through the US, you have to have US lawyers manage that, um, which is a lot more expensive. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, that would be, a, on the other hand, there's a lot more capital in terms of the sheer amount of capital there. So for the right type of business, I think it can work well. Um, and I would say some of the US um, US VCs are maybe more evolved and on, on kind of the, the operating partner role um, that they have over there and providing, you know, other services other than just cash. Not to say that we don't do that in Australia. It's just, I think, more mature there in terms yeah. of, you know, recruitment services, marketing services, go to market, you know, the, they've got, you know, big functions that focus on that, which, yeah. you know, we, we're starting to do that in, in Australia. Yeah, yeah, well, I've, you certainly said that with Airtree, you know, you, you're doing a bunch of those things now, a Blackbird, the same sort of thing. So it seems like that, that, that seems to be the, you know, the sort of path, um, you know, providing more than just the cash. Though, when, when I, when I get asked, uh, you know, what should we kind of look for in a, in a, in a VC and so on and so forth, I always say, you know, be happy with the valuation and the amount of cash you're getting and the terms of the, of the, of the deal, be happy with that and expect nothing more. If you get something else, great. Um, and you probably will, don't get me wrong, but don't expect it, you know, cause then you can be happy with the deal that you've done on the, on, on the dollars. Yes. Um, you know, um, this is a good one. Um, what type of considerations are taken into account when determining valuation? Always a big question for, for founders. Um, 
I think like anything, the value of a business is what people are prepared to pay for it as well. So I think yeah. the value the valuation as a founder you need to think about is how much capital is going to be available and how much you're willing to dilute. So um, those, those things are important. Valuations um, are determined uh, well a number of ways. There's lots of peer peer to peer kind of comparisons. So they'll be looking at similar. Um, obviously in SaaS there are so many kind of metrics that you can look at and then look at the multiples of those metrics whether that be you know revenue, ARR, multiples or whatever those metrics tend to be so those can be used for, for, for valuations as well you know often um, those comparisons are, are probably the best kind of benchmark for coming up with, with mm. a value um, but you know VCs will, will often look at you know the val and then they'll be looking at how much will that give me in terms of percentage the vcs really need to have a decent share of a business um to make it you know worth investing in to, to meet their kind of return on investment and um, projections that they want as well so yeah. that has to be you know that has to be factored into it as well you know they, they don't want yeah. one two percent of a barely early stage company so um, yeah. I, think, I think capital availability valuation and share of the cap table are all kind of part of the same yeah. decision particularly early on where like you know ultimately if you're doing really not very much revenue um it gets hard doesn't it so so that kind of all right well we, we want to own x percent to make it worth our time um and as you say um if there's a lot of competition then um the price goes up you know <laughs> as with anything um yeah but on the other hand, this is, this is, sorry it's a challenging one because like the best companies have every vc wanting to invest in them and then 97 percent of companies have no one wanting to invest in them so you know um I, I would say that vcs will walk away if the vow's too high for them i mean i've i've definitely seen that so um i think everyone's just looking for something that's fair yeah and reasonable yeah, yeah, for and, sure. and as you said it's difficult though sometimes if you're pre-revenue um or something like obviously doing something that no one's ever done before it's hard to put a, put a price on it yeah we've got so many questions coming in so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, what we'll do at the end of this is we'll um we'll actually just kind of put them all in, a, in, in an email and, and try and answer some of them and send them out because we won't, won't get to all of them but this is a good one. Um, a solo founders at a disadvantage when it comes to raising capital. Um, I think to go back to that point on team, I think it's all about the team because you know it's hard to run a business solely on your own. If that founder has got a track record of you know raising money, then he's going to find it much easier. Or she's going to find it much easier to raise again. I definitely noticed that when I was CEO of Vamp, having worked at Safety Culture, having had that track record, it's much easier to raise money because people are investing in you, as I said, rather than you know yeah. obviously part of the business. So I think um, that is something to to consider. And um, but I think surround yourself with other good people they don't have to be founders but if you've got a good team or good network of advisors that's always helpful as well yep um another one um this is a good one do you need to raise a seed round to be a viable vc investment um in, in a bit more detail we're a b2b SaaS platform and the founders are considering bootstrapping uh, before ra uh, before raising a larger first round. So I guess the question is, can you go to VC without having raised anything and with um, presumably not much in the way of traction and 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 raise a seed round? Absolutely. I think everyone should try and bootstrap, shouldn't they? Like to begin with, you know, if, if the longer you bootstrap, the the more you own of your company longer term. So I think mm. you know, I don't think VCs would look negatively on a, a bootstrapped company, but obviously you want to you want to take equity and raise capital when the opportunities are far greater than the cost of that capital. So if you think yeah. by taking capital you could grow faster than the capital costs you, then you should do it. Um, so. It, you know 
that's, and I think that's that's that's, that's the key on on I, I think a lot of founders probably don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about the cost of capital. Uh, do you want to actually just go into a bit more detail on that because I think that's that's a helpful way of people thinking about should I be raising or not? Yeah, um, I think what you should be looking at is how the financials and the growth that you can get and how you put that capital to work and what the <coughs> sorry what the end result is going to be for that and then look at the I suppose the proportion that you'll you'll own and the proportion that the VC will own if you take that mm -hmm. capital and then you can look at you know if I take four million or I take three million how does that really how can I put that to work and what I would say yep. as well don't take too much capital because what you don't want is lazy capital. So you don't want capital sitting in your bank account doing nothing for, you know, 12 to 18 months. You want to be using that yeah. capital. Use that capital, get more value in your company and then go raise again because then you'll be raising at higher valuation. Um, you, you'll be owning more at a higher valuation. So use the cap, take the capital that you need to get you to the next milestone of growth yeah. and then always again on that so i think that's my, my that's my view on cost of capital yeah and 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 again that's why when you start thinking about different options like venture debt you know often you'll say kind of like, you know venture debt in australia overseas too is you know you're paying about 12 percent on venture debt and, and 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 people go that's really expensive um and the reality is if you actually look at the numbers it's often much, much, much cheaper than raising equity. And this is something that, yeah, you start off with 100% of the company and um, it's the only thing you've got a finite amount of, <laughs> you know, percentage share. Or, yes, you can keep issuing shares, but your percentage share is going to keep, keep, keep decreasing. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty important to, to at least understand what you're doing. If you're, if you're a super, you know, high growth company and raising a large amount of capital is going to get you to the next step where you get a you know, much higher valuation and you're creating value, then by all means um, do it, but understand what you're doing, I guess, is, is, the, is the point. Um, this is a, you want to talk about safe, safe agreements? Have you dealt with safes much or? or um, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing them uh, air tree. I haven't in my, my first five weeks, but we're definitely seeing um, safe notes coming through for um, early stage startups, you know, as a, yeah. like an alternative to a con note, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we, I think right now we probably, we probably do more safe notes than we do um, con notes. And for whatever reason, that seems to be the, 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 the you know, there are reasons Thanks. why um, they're kind of more popular, but um, you know, I guess the, the question here is how do I best approach potential investors with regards to a safe note with a fair proposal? And, and look, I, look, the answer is probably it's the same same with equity um you know it's it's really no different um from, from a you know what's fair perspective and what's fair will be all the things you, you spoke about um previously so let's move on to another question um with vc funds in australia do founders often have equity percentage protection to stop their percentage being watered down uh between different funding rounds I think it will depend on what you negotiate, won't it? Like, mm. I think uh, when you take, yeah. I think I think the question, so I think the question is, is do the founders get anti-dilution protection? And I can't say that I've ever seen that in, in any deal ever in the history of this business, at least. So, I think the answer to that is probably no, um, to be honest. So often, if you can negotiate uh, it, then go for it. <laughs> Well, sure, yeah, yeah. So investors will sometimes get anti-dilution protection um, yeah. with various structures, but rarely the founders. Um, oh, that's a good one. So yeah, we're actually right at the end now. So, um, and we'll, we'll end on, on this question because it's a good one, um, which is what's the best way to connect with the right person at Airtree or Blackbird, but I'll just leave Airtree for now. <laughs> um, just um, connect with us directly, you know, I'm Jill at airtree.vc, so um, 
the team's growing all the time and, and similarly Blackbird and Square Peg we're all we're all growing quite rapidly but it's a tight team um, we have um, an investment team I'm part of the, the kind of operating part of the team but our investment team um, see pitch decks uh, every day you know there's like 20-30 um, going through our desks every single week every week we have you know we assess all these um, the leads that come through um, so it's just part and parcel of what we do every day so send anything on to us directly. Cool. And that's the same for a lot of the VCs. You know, I just go on the website and I'll say, you know, send us something, you know, and they'll read it. And if it's good, uh, they'll, they'll be in touch. Um, and the other question was, uh, does Legal Vision introduce um, introduce founders to potential investors? And, and the answer is yes, we do all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's challenging because we have so many um, clients kind of sending us things. And I talk to all, all of, um, you know, the, the contacts I have in VC. And they always say, just send it through to us. So we're very happy to kind of send th send anything through, give a bit of context if you're a client um, onto all of our various contacts. Um, and we've had a bunch of you know um, clients over the years that have raised large amounts of money from from those introductions. So we're always happy to do it. Um, before we kind of finish off, and I said thank you, just wanted to quickly say, um, obviously as I mentioned previously, we we at Legal Vision do. Definitely more um, startup capital raises than any law firm in Australia. We're, we're number one by by a long way, and constantly growing the size of the team here and the number of clients. So, if you're looking to raise around, um, you know, please do get in touch. One thing I would say is there are a handful of, of kind of law firms or lawyers in law firms uh, that are actually good at this type of work in Australia, and and there's maybe five or six you know, people who do it well. And by all means go with those what you should not do and I, and I implore you as a as a founder is turn up um to discussions with a vc with a lawyer who doesn't really know what they're doing uh because it makes you look kind of silly and um you know it might not it might mean you still get a deal done but it's not a great way to start off your relationship with new investors so make sure whoever you you're working with on, on the legal side they've done a lot of capital raises and not just, you know, raising money um, for mum and dad's kebab shop, but actually raising, you know, for a high growth startup businesses with VCs investing, proper VCs investing. Um, to help you on your way with that, we have a special offer um, for our LV Connect Pro membership, which is basically where we have a membership structure at Legal Vision, which, which you know, works super well. You can check out the details on the website. We've got a special offer for everyone who's joined this webinar, just get in touch with our client care team through the website, mention the special offer, and um, we'll sort you out on that. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of close that off, is there anything uh, from an Airtree perspective, Jill, you'd like to kind of share um, to finish things off? I think, um, yeah, as you said, we, we are happy to take um, anyone's pitch deck through. We are very open to it. We do coffees. Every day, day in, day out with founders, it's part of what we do. Um, and what I would say on Airtree's website as well, there's a lot of open sourced VC resources there that will help. There's, you know, there's, there's term sheets, standard term sheets for a seed round. You know, there's various templates and documents that you can use. I know similar to Legal Vision, your, your playbook has something similar as well. So I think there's a lot of resources out there that you don't have to go and spend a lot of money on. So hit up all the, the VCs websites you might find and um, what you need before you have to go and pay somebody to do it. And when you do pay somebody to do it, to, to reiterate Lachlan's point, make sure they are good because don't don't um, take a term sheet, don't take your first term sheet and get no legal advice. It's not a good idea. Yeah. And certainly make sure you get legal advice when the term sheet comes. Sometimes, you know, we'll have founders come to us, they've already signed the term sheet and then, yeah. then they're like, can you negotiate the documents for us? Well, it's the term sheet where, you know, the, the guts of the agreement are kind of set out. So make sure you come to us with the term sheet you know, as, as soon as you get it. Um, lastly, all the uh, questions that we didn't answer, we'll kind of like try and answer, stick them in an email and send to all the attendees. So thank you everyone for joining. We'll try and do more of these. Um, if you liked it, please uh, provide feedback. If you didn't like it, please provide feedback too. Uh, we're always trying to improve them. Um, but look, have a great week. And Jill, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye guys. Have a good day. Thanks.